All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to yet another What the Bible Says About Bible Study, um, where we'd like to welcome everybody who's on tonight. Um, we're very excited for our guest speaker tonight, Mikey Jenny. Um, tonight's topic is called Accepting Bible Truths. So I know we live in a world right now where there's a lot of false things being taught, but praise God that God's word is true and his word never changes and God never changes. So praise God that tonight we have our guest speaker, Mikey Jenny, who will hit on this topic and a little bit about our guest speaker, Mikey Jenny. I have the blessing to have met him at CYC, I believe two years now in a row. I've gotten the pleasure of meeting him with Scotty through Little Light Studios when they've come to our conference. So I'm very personally appreciative of you guys and this ministry because it opened my mind to um my my mind to so many things that I did not know about the media, the movies. And so I'm grateful and I'm excited for your study tonight. Um, just a little introduction of Mikey. Um, he's been a truth seek seeker as long as he can remember. He was raised up in church, but as a 12 year old began to have a lot of skeptical and tough questions that the church didn't give satisfying answers for. He began to search for truth in the cult, going down the road of witchcraft. When all those roads led to hopelessness and emptiness, he decided to give God a true chance by reading the Bible and his life was radically transformed. Since then, God has led his path into ministry where he desires to give the answers to people's tough questions, such as the ones he had. So praise God for that. Um, let's just have a little word of prayer and, and then I'll pass it over to my dear brother, Mikey. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, we are so thankful, Lord, yet for another opportunity, Lord, to gather, Father, here now. Um, we are just inviting your Holy Spirit, Lord, and we know and trust that where two or three are gathered in your name, Lord, there you are in the midst. Father, tonight you have a message for each one of us that you want us to hear, Lord, in regards to your truth, the word, Father, your word. I'm asking, Lord, that you please be with our brother Mikey Jenny, Father. Please hide him behind the cross, that every word that he speaks tonight, Lord, may be your words. And I pray for our hearts and our minds, Lord, that we may be receptive to your truth, Lord, that if there's any conviction that needs to be made, Lord, that we will not grieve the Holy Spirit, Lord, but that we will be willing, Father, to be transformed by you, Lord. Please remove all distractions, Father, anything that may hinder us from receiving your word tonight, Lord. We just remove it. And Lord, we just ask for everyone um, who's unable to make it, Lord, um, please be with them in a special way as well, Lord. And thank you in advance for the blessings we'll receive through this study, Lord. In Jesus' loving name we pray. Amen. So it's all yours, Brother Mikey. Amen. Thank you so much. It is so good to be here with you guys this evening. And I'm going to um, share my screen here. I hope I can do that easily. Let's see. Hmm, okay, share keynote. And are you guys able to see me and the keynote? Sometimes it's hard to tell what's going on with these. Whoops. Yeah, we could see you and the and the PowerPoint. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Let me move this. So yeah, as um. The introduction said, I have always been a truth seeker my whole life. And so I'm going to share my, my testimony and then I'm going to get into what kind of verses really uh, woke me up and kind of changed my whole understanding of what I thought I knew about the Bible and what I thought I knew about life and really everything, even science and everything. Um, the Bible radically changed my life. And so I was actually raised by parents who were both Baptist. Uh, their whole family was Baptist. And so I, I was raised up in church. My parents, we went to church every Sunday, every Wednesday. I went to uh, Awana's, which is kind of like a, a scouts, a Christian scouts and, um, you know, vacation Bible school, all that stuff. And so I, my parents trained me up in the way that, that I should go. Like the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's older, he will not depart from it. I'm going to try to rush through my story a little bit. I, sometimes it can take me over an hour to share everything, but I want to get to the verses and stuff. So if you guys want to hear more details, it's out there. But basically, 
when I reached about age nine, I remember I was alone in a car. My mom was in inside the church transcribing the pastor's sermon back then. There wasn't AI or any of that stuff. And um, so she was actually listening to a tape and using a typewriter. And I was just out there alone with my thoughts at nine years old. And that was like my age of accountability. Like the age where I realized at that moment, I'm a sinner. I'm, I've already lied, stolen, cheated. I've done everything wrong. There's nothing I can do to erase that. There's nothing I can do to earn heaven or deserve heaven. The only way I can get to God is by Jesus Christ's sacrifice. And in that moment, I accepted Christ. And I said, Lord, come into my heart. And I teared up and my mom came out and it uh, had to have been the best day of her life when I told her I accepted Christ. Her nine-year-old boy accepted Christ. No, no pressure from a church or anything, just him and God. And shortly after that, I was getting baptized into the Baptist church. Um, and then we started venturing into some, um, we started visiting my aunt and uncle's church. And it was a little more charismatic. It was a non-denominational church. And a lot of the uh, doctrines are still the same. It's When people say non-denominational, I basically say it's like Baptists who wear blue jeans and speak in tongues and you know lift their hands and dance and stuff. And I started going to... Uh, the youth group and I was surrounded by these older teens that I looked up to and they're going on mission trips and doing all this awesome stuff for God. And I remember I even had a little, a small collection of comic books and I felt convicted about these comic books and I set them on fire in a grill. And I remember seeing green fire come out of it. I'll never forget that moment. And so I, I had a friend or two that I really hung out with that were Christian as well, that went to my church and I, I just kind of had this zeal for a while but, you know, my parents, they knew the power of media. They knew that the media can influence you, change your life and all that stuff, change your morals. And so they would say things like, we're not going to watch MTV. We're not going to watch The Simpsons and Beavis and Butthead and all these raunchy cartoons and stuff. And when I got to be about age 11 or so, I remember I would get to spend the night at friends' houses. And their parents, even if they were Christian, didn't have the same guardrails that my parents did. So now I'm getting to see the rated R movies. And I'm getting to play the violent video games that are like brand new, like Mortal Kombat just came out, the first game with, you know, blood in it. And I remember thinking, man, this is fun. And I was like, why is this wrong? It feels fun. It feels so good. How could it be wrong? And I remember my parents would go to the grocery store and I'd stay home and I would turn on MTV and I'd see MTV spring break and everybody's in bikinis and they're hooking up and drinking and there's a, a rock band on stage and it looks awesome. And I know that no Christian should be in that crowd, but why, why is, and I started to have these doubts. I started to have these thoughts like, is Christianity just about everything that's fun is bad. And so I, I became seduced by the media because Satan loves to package sin in a way that's fun and glamorous because sin is fun for a season, but ultimately that road will lead to death and destruction and uh, just all kinds of hectic things in your life, drama. And so you'll see uh, so many movies where there's like these geeks in the school and they can't, they're just trying so hard to be popular and they want to go to that party. And, and by the end of the movie, they get to go to that party and they're, they're getting drunk and everybody's cheering them on and everybody thinks they're cool now and they get to hook up with a girl and then the credits roll happily ever after. What that movie doesn't show you is that an addiction started that night and that a, a girl got pregnant at that party that ended up in a, an unwanted pregnancy that ended up in an abortion and somebody drove home drunk and killed somebody and now they're spending the rest of their life in jail. See, Hollywood loves to glamorize sin and the occult and all these things, but it never shows you the, the total outcome, whereas the Bible will show you sin, but it'll show you where that road leads to. And so I wasn't seeing that big picture. Like I said, I was a truth seeker and I, and I never wanted to just believe something because it was spoon fed to me. I had to kind of see the proof of it. And so I was super intrigued with the paranormal. And when I was in elementary school at a public school system, I would check out books in the library on ghosts and aliens. And I'm not talking about like goosebumps and stuff like that. I'm talking about like photographs of there's some strange figure in the hallway or what is that glowing object in the sky? And I believed it. I believe there are ghosts 
there are aliens and um and christians didn't have good answers for these things i would ask you know what what's a ghost and i, I don't know what are, what about aliens i don't know and so i i started to have these really tough questions because i didn't want to surrender my life to some lifestyle or belief and just waste away my life for it to be fake for all my life to be dedicated to this belief system that basically kept me from having fun my whole life and i died and i found out everything was a lie anyway and i could have been living life or whatever it was i just wanted to know the truth and so i started i began to think real quickly that the church didn't have the answers i would start to ask very tough skeptical questions that i had i would go to youth group and then i would um, basically interrogate the youth pastor at the door and i'd say if if god said thou shalt not kill why did he murder the entire world and i would get answers from those pastors and the people that are supposed to have the answers i would get answers like you know some things we just won't know until we get to heaven and that was a cop out to me that added to my skepticism and my faith in the church it added to my skepticism and doubt in the church. And so at by age 11 or 12, I was just, I was done. I was cut off. I had that quick zeal from nine to age 10 or 11 or 12 or so. But by then I was, I was checked out and I said, the church doesn't have the answers and see, I believe that we should have answers to tough questions. We're not supposed to check out our brain because we become a, a Christian. We live in a world of disinformation, misinformation, all kinds of, we have the entire world's library at the tip of our fingertips, but there's all kinds of information out there. You can find out that the world, uh, that the universe just exploded from a big bang and, and all this perfection evolved from single celled amoebas and all this stuff. But there's so many different thoughts out there. And as the church, we need to have answers to these tough questions, especially for young people. Young people have really tough questions. And so in, in the book of Peter, it says, be ready always, be ready and willing always to give an answer for the faith and the hope in what you have. And so I, I cling to that. And I, I want to have the answers for every question. And there are plenty of things that I don't have the answers to, and it drives me crazy. But I always, I, I love the challenge. I love when somebody gives me an, a question that I don't have the answer for. And it gives me something to go seeking after I can dig in God's word and try to find the answer to that. So here I am. I don't, I don't believe in God anymore. And I, I turn on the TV and I see Marilyn Manson on the screen for the first time. And he's this Gothic rocker, shock rocker guy. If you guys don't know who he is and something in me immediately said, I want to be just like that. And people say, what, what was that? What made I don't know. It's the mystery of iniquity. We're drawn to sin. Our flesh is at enmity with God, the Bible says. And I'm, I'm sharing verses along the way because this is all proof. I'm, I'm living proof that my flesh is at enmity with God, that there's nothing in me that wants God unless the Holy Spirit um, can, continues to whisper in my ear and I finally heed to that voice and surrender to him. Then I have a desire for God. But naturally, we don't want anything to do with God because it convicts our, our sinful ways in our life. And we don't like that feeling, but that feeling is what pushes us towards God. And so, you know, a lot of people just reject the idea of God. You, there's a lot of quote unquote atheists out there. And I say quote unquote, because 90% of the atheists I know spend a lot of their time mocking and mocking Christians and ridiculing and, and trying to dis like make posts that, that Christ isn't real, that God isn't real. And it's like, if I didn't believe in the Easter bunny, which I don't, I don't make a lot of posts on my wall that say the Easter bunny isn't real. I can prove it. It's not real. I don't need to waste my time. But when atheists spend so much time and effort, you know, saying that God isn't real, and this is why it's only really proving that there is a God and they're trying to get rid of him because if God is real, then their life has to change. And they don't like that. They don't want that. But that feeling is supposed to push us towards God because we realize that there's nothing we can do to be good or holy. And so I see Marilyn Manson. I want to be just like him. And uh, this is a picture of me on the screen. By age 14, by 13, I wanted to look like this. By, by 12, basically, as soon as I saw him, I wanted to be just like this. But my parents were still kind of 
holding the reins back. But by age 14, I just kind of rebelled and started doing all the stuff on my own. They, I'd say, I want my ears pierced. And they say, we don't want you to pierce your ears. And I just come out in the living room the next day with my eyebrow pierced because I pierced them myself. And I'm 14 years old and they're kind of in a predicament. They're like, you know, what do we do? Because if we try to make them say, try to say you can't do this, what if he runs away or whatever, you know, it's like there comes an age where parents are in a, in a weird place where they don't know how much they can like force rules and things. And so I just started rebelling and I started wearing a pentagram and all black. And I started uh, reading websites about is witchcraft real. And I started going down this road of witchcraft and uh, I had moved to this redneck city, redneck town in South Georgia. And that's not a derogatory term. They will put redneck right on top of their truck. They're proud of it. And I hated living there. And I, I never thought I'd meet a friend. And I finally did meet a friend. And he was just like me. And we started making music together that sounded just like Marilyn Manson and Nine Inch Nails. And we refused to make music sober. Our inspiration came from marijuana and alcohol and preferably marijuana. Why? We're, we called it inspiration. There's a, there's a, that word comes from the phrase inspirited. And I do believe that you get inspiration from the spirit world. If you're asking God, Lord, give me the right words to say, put the right people in my path, not my words, but your words, then, then you're being led by the Holy Spirit. But those who are partaking in drinking spirits, they literally call it wine and spirits. They do, people will get drunk and they do things that they'd never do sober. They black out. They don't even remember it just like they're being possessed. And then you look at marijuana and how you look at Native Americans, they pass around a peace pipe as a religious ritual. Smoking marijuana is not just some recreational thing to have fun. It's literally a spiritual experience. And so I would smoke weed and he'd play the guitar and words would just flow out of my mouth that rhymed and made sense. And most of the time were blasphemous because I was at a place where I just hated Christianity. Christianity was holding the world back, I thought. And it was narrow minded and all this stuff. And so I would sing songs mocking the crucifixion using the very breath that God gave me. And it breaks my heart when I think about it now, but I was going down this road and, and, um, uh, I would, I would see my friends playing a Ouija board and I'd, I'd say, let me try. And I'd put my hands on it and nothing would happen. I'd, I'd go into a graveyard looking for ghosts and would never see anything. And now I know it's because my mom never stopped praying for me every night. My mom was praying that God would win me somehow. And she knew every time she shared her testimony around me, it made my skin crawl. I hated to hear it. Um, every time she would try to talk to me about God, I hated it. And so she started praying, God, you send somebody that he's going to listen to somebody that he looks up to. And God answered that prayer. My parents went through a divorce and me and my dad decided to move back to Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I wanted to be again in the big city. And my cousin drove five hours to help me and my dad move because he had a pickup truck. And so while we're packing up his truck, I hear my cousin sharing with my mom that he became a Christian and he's sharing his testimony. And now it, this is intriguing me because at this point I I've already reached rock bottom every day. I was plagued with the thought, why am I here? What is the point of all this? If, if I go to school to become the, the next neurosurgeon or the next rocket scientist or a jailbird my entire life. What's the difference? If the end of this thing is just death and deletion and there's nothing more of it, what is the point of all this? And I was plagued with that thought. So I would escape those thoughts through alcohol and marijuana and sex and just everything that I could do that felt good to escape these feelings. But those things are all counterfeits of what we're looking for. We're looking for the peace of God. He's the only one that can fill that God-shaped vacuum in your heart. And we're filling it with all these temporal pleasures that end up leading to regrets the next day. And now I'm at this rock bottom place. I've tried everything. Everything is hopelessness and emptiness. And I end up in the truck with him for a five hour drive. And he's got me captive audience, just me and him. And he said, man, I know you think this book is just a, a bunch of old crusty rules, but he said, man, it's got the answers to life in it. He said, man, I read this book and miracles happen. And he said, I, he's looking at me and he sees the way I am. And he says, man, it, when I pray, I see miracles happen. He's like, it's like that magic stuff you're into. Now see, magic is a counterfeit of miracles, but he was trying to reach me where I was and he intrigued me. And he said, don't judge God by all the hypocrites that represent him. 
And that really spoke to me because when I looked like this, I was judged by everybody. All my friends, their parents didn't want them hanging out with me because they were judging me by my appearance. And when they'd get to know me, they'd say, um, I never, oh, you're not nothing like I thought you'd be. And I, I said, oh, were you judging me? And I hated judgment. And yet I realized that I was judging God. I knew nothing about God. I never read his word. All I knew was what I heard spewed from behind a pulpit or what I heard from some hypocritical Christian, but I never really sought God myself and God in his word and or anything. And so he challenged me, he said, man, just read the Bible. Don't don't worry about uh, whatever. Don't go to church. None of this. Just read the Bible. And so I, I said, okay, I will. He intrigued me enough to do it. And so I moved in with his sister. Me and my dad uh, stayed with his sister until we could get on our feet and we were looking for jobs and I was, I remember going to my room and open up the Bible. And I said, God, if you're real, reveal yourself to me through this Bible, like you did my cousin. And I, I started reading the Bible and it was mind blowing. In the first book, the book of Genesis, I heard stories that I'd never heard before in my entire life. My whole life growing up, I heard Adam and Eve and Noah's Ark and Daniel in the lion's den and all these core stories. But a lot of the stuff was just ear tickling sermons about you health and wealth and all this stuff. And I'm reading stuff that I've never heard before, like uh, Lot's daughters getting them drunk in a cave and all kinds of crazy stuff. And it was an interesting book. And I was like, I want to keep reading this book. And so I'd read the book and I wanted a job at Hot Topic. If you've never heard of Hot Topic, it's a store in the mall that sells all this gothic clothing and they play metal music and you can dress just like this. And I, I, uh, I filled out the application and I turned it in and I didn't hear anything back. And so I prayed. I said, God, if you're real, get me the job at Hot Topic. I Xeroxed the application 10 times. And every day I was turning in an application. Never heard anything back. They, I'd call them and I was just annoying them. And what I found out was you don't get that job unless you know somebody. Because a lot of weirdos like this in the picture want to work there. And they don't know who to trust. So you have to know somebody. And I was new to Chattanooga again. I didn't know anybody. And... um and I was actually starting to walk out of other interviews. They would tell me at some point, there's three interviews that said, you know, you can't wear all that stuff in your face, right? And I'd, I'd stand up and say, oh, I didn't know you discriminate against people with piercings. And I'd walk out. And my cousins had to have a sit down talk with me, my cousin and her husband. And they said, look, we're, we're trying to help you get on your feet. Your dad's got a job and you're walking out of interviews. And so they said, maybe God's trying to show you that these piercings have become an idol in your life. And I was not ready to hear that at all. They knew I was seeking. They'd walk by my room and see me looking like this, reading the Bible. I would go to their Baptist church with them. And, and God was using that pastor because he was a real visual aid type person. And that's I'm a real visual person. And so I was actually being intrigued and drawn, looking like this. And that's why I say, don't judge people. Where We don't know where they're at in their heart. They might look like this and you might never... You might think I could never talk to them about God. They're going to mock me or or whatever, or they're not going to receive it. You might say this guy's hopeless, but I was looking for God. I was searching and I was reading God's word. I was praying a prayer, uh, putting God to the test and I was going to church. And uh, so I did what I had to do. I took out my piercings, put on a collared shirt, went down this long road, put in applications everywhere. Finally, in the last place on the road, it was already nighttime. I, I went in and it was this barbecue restaurant and this lady, the, the assistant manager was talking to me at the door and she said, oh, do you got piercings or something? Lip rings? She could see the two holes in my lip. And I said, yeah, you know, I had to get them. Out. I had to take them out, get a job working for the man. And she goes, oh, I understand. And she flipped out her septum piercing. The bridge of her nose was pierced and she was hiding it in her nostrils. She said, come back tomorrow. I want, you, I want to introduce you to my manager. So I came back the next day, got the job, was not the job I was praying for. It was the job that I didn't want. I didn't, I hated being fake. That's why I wanted to work at Hot Topic. I wanted to be me. I wanted to dress like this. I didn't want to put on a, a fake uniform and say a script like, have you tried the nachos today? And now I got this job doing all the stuff I didn't want to do. Well, after about, or a few more days, you know, the weeks went by and I remember I didn't get to work with this lady that I, you know, the first lady I talked to that much. But one day I was working with her and I said, you know, I really wanted a job at Hot Topic. And she said, oh, my best friend's the manager over there. Wow, big shock, right? 
I don't believe in coincidences. I was praying for a job at Hot Topic. God works in the super, he works supernaturally through the natural. I thought I'd, you know, pray for a car and it would materialize in front of me, but God is working behind the scenes through the natural. And he was leading me to meet the right person who was best friends with the manager at Hot Topic because you have to know somebody to get that job. Now, some people might say, why would God get you a job at Hot Topic? That's a legitimate question. When God told the Israelites he didn't want them to have a king, they said, we want a king. God said, you want a king? You got a king. They said, we're sick of the manna. We want meat. He said, you want meat? I'll give you so much meat. It's coming out of your noses. Sometimes God meets you where you're at because he knows the beginning from the end. And he knew that if he answered my prayer, I was putting him to the test. If he answered that prayer, that I would become a believer and that I would be here today sharing my testimony with you and as well as all over the places that I've been invited to share my testimony and, and work in ministry. And so God was meeting me where I was and he's such an intimate and personal God that he knows every intimate detail of your life, of your heart. He knows exactly what it takes for you to receive him. And so now I'm at this place where I'm like, okay, I believe the Bible. I believe God exists. I believe prayer works, but I'm not ready to become a Christian yet. I knew my whole life was going to have to change. I was 21 years old. I was in the clubs every night. I was partying. I was having a good time. And I thought, you know what? Maybe when I'm on my deathbed, when I'm on my deathbed, then I'll invite you in. And then I, then I can go to heaven. My get hell, get out of hell free card, right? That's a bad motive. God is, God wants to do so much with your life. Now we, we are here, but for a blip and the Bible says we're like a, like a vapor that we just were here one day, gone tomorrow, like the flowers in the field. And he wants to use us while we're here. He's got huge plans for us. And yet we're so selfish and we want to do things our own way. And But God is so long suffering and patient. And so here I am going about my life, working at Hot Topic. I start my own clothing line. It's called Execute Clothing. And it's starting to get big models from all around the world. California, Spain, Australia are starting to wear the the clothes and, and my favorite famous bands are on stage wearing my clothes. And I'm just like, man, this, my dreams are coming true. And I'm chasing after this dream. I want, I want my clothing line to blow up, but I'm so distracted by parties, 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 parties all the time. And that's Satan's biggest weapon, distraction. You know, when Jesus was in the wilderness, how did Jesus fight against Satan? He didn't go at him physically. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. All three of the temptations that Satan came at him with, which were very powerful temptations, like you're starving 40 days in, in the wilderness, no food. Why don't you turn this rock into bread? Or, and, and, and Satan quotes scripture. He's like, throw yourself off of this temple and, and the angels will catch you. You won't cast, it won't dash your foot upon a stone and all this stuff. It is written, it is written, it is written. But guess what? If you don't know what is written, we cannot fight the devil. And it bothers me when people think of the devil as this small, like, oh, he ain't nothing. He is. He's a powerful angel that deceived a perfect Eve in the Garden of Eden into disobeying God. You think that he can deceive a perfect being like Eve, but not us? One angel could slay thousands of people in the Bible. Satan is an angel. And so we're fooling ourselves if we think that we're too smart to be deceived by him. And so Satan loves distraction. He doesn't care if you're in the occult. He doesn't care if you're a witch or if you're in new age. If he can get you playing Tetris all day long, then he has the upper hand because you're not in prayer and you're not in the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. And this is how we fight spiritual warfare. And so I was distracted all the time. Parties, parties, parties. But one particular day in April 2015, 2005, sorry, nobody was available. I was, I was calling people and they were out of town or on a date or something. So I just went home um, to my house, my apartment. And uh, it was just me. My, my cousin who was going through a divorce, she was back in my room and we shared a, the room back there. But I couldn't wake her up. She had school and, and work and she was not a morning person. I wasn't going to dare wake her up. And so it's just me by myself and I'm sitting there, I go in the living room and I turn on the Simpsons and I, I'm drinking a big beer and I'm smoking marijuana 
because I'm just relaxing after a long day day's work. And as I'm sitting there, I hear this voice or this impression. It's weird to say I, I heard God, but it's really this overwhelming thought that's not your own. I, all I cared about was relaxing and getting high and drunk. There was no thought in my mind that thought, why don't you pray? But this overwhelming thought said, why don't you pray? And so I bowed my head. I, I muted the TV and I bowed my head. And I said, God, I don't know what I'm praying about, but I just pray for this thing in my life and, and my, my friend that you'll help them. And as I'm praying this prayer, I hear that same voice say, this is your moment. Right then I opened my eyes and I was like, nah, that wasn't God. That was just, I'm not ready. That's not, that was just some random thought. The moment I thought that it was like a ton of bricks hit me and it was like, you're searching for God. He's revealing himself to you. And and you believe the Bible exists. You believe he answers prayer. Why can't you believe he's saving your life right now? Why can't you believe he wants a relationship with you right here, right now, in the midst of your sin and muck in this apartment, drinking and watching The Simpsons? I thought I had to clean myself up to come to God. But guess what? If you're waiting to clean yourself up, you'll never get there because we can't clean ourselves up. We will try and we'll fail every time. He can, he's the only one that can clean you up. And when you surrender your life to him and let him in and give him permission to just remove everything, he will do the work. And so right then I just bow my head and I say, God, I, I believe you exist. I, I want a relationship with you Come into my life. And God started bringing things to my memory. My mom's salvation testimony verse was believe in all things are possible to him that believeth. And when she would say that stuff, it make my skin crawl but he brought it to my mind and and now it made sense it didn't it didn't make my skin crawl and I, and he brought to my mind the magnet i got my mom that said believe in all things are possible to him that believeth and god was just revealing these things that were personal intimate details of my life and i felt like the sky was bluer and the grass was greener and everything just seemed to be going right i had peace that i never had before joy that i never had before and it was getting late and i needed to go to bed and i needed to go back there to the room where my cousin was and so on the walk back to my room, this fear came in, this doubt came into my mind. What if this is all fake? What if none of this is real? And I start shaking. The moment that enters my mind, my whole body starts to shake and tremble. And I said, no, I believe in instantaneous peace from the Prince of Peace. I take another step, tremors, tremors, instantaneous peace. It was like, Satan loves it when you're one foot in the world and one foot in the church because you're not a witness to anyone. Jesus says you will know them by their fruits, not because you proclaim to be a Christian and you carry a Bible and wear a cross and go to a church. You'll know them by their fruits. And I had no fruit. And so even though I was a believer, Satan knew that I never accepted Christ in my heart, that I was waiting for my you know, to be on my deathbed. And now Satan knew that he was losing me. And there was this battle between God and Satan and angels and demons and fear and faith. And it was just going back and forth and trim tremors and, and peace. And I finally got into my room and I was shaking so bad that the picture frames on the wall were rattling. And I was like, no, I'm going to wake up my cousin. I believe. And I finally made it to my bed and just threw the blankets over my head. And I just felt the presence of God like I never felt before. This overwhelming just sense of love and peace and joy. But then the next day I woke up and it's like, well, now what? I didn't even know what to do with it. I went from being an anti-Christ. I was never an atheist. I was always an agnostic. I, I believed in the paranormal, super intrigued with the paranormal. And now I'm like, okay, now I'm a Christian. Now what? I, I, I feel like if I share it with people, they're going to think I'm shoving it down their throat. So I just kind of kept it to myself. But I started seeking truth from my cousin, the one who inspired me to read the Bible. I started hanging out with him a lot because he'd been a Christian for a lot longer than I had. And I was like, well, he must know the answers. That's a mistake too. We have to seek the answers in the word of God for ourselves, or we can be led astray easy. Just like Satan, Satan quotes scripture, but 90%, 99% truth is not truth. That's deception. That's the little eyedropper of poison in that ice cold glass of lemonade that you're just ready to drink up. You wouldn't drink it if it was in a bottle of poison, but because it's hidden in this glass of lemonade and it tastes like lemonade, it smells like lemonade, then we'll drink it right up. And so that's how Satan works. A lot of truth and a little bit of error. 
And so I started asking my cousin, my older, cooler cousin, who's been a Christian for a long time. And he would be like, man, you got all the girls. You're like King Solomon. He'd say, man, you got all the free alcohol. And you're like, uh, Jesus turned water into wine. He said, you know, the book of Genesis says every green herb bearing seed is for man. You got all the free marijuana. And I was believing this because I wasn't reading the word of God myself. And I was believing that God's will for my life was to continue being a party animal. And I have all the girls and alcohol and marijuana. And so me and my friend, we started a rap group and, and we would do these monthly shows called the block crusher. And that was the most packed I'd ever seen that club get. And we would promote this na cheap, nasty beer called Bud Ice. And it got so popular. People were tagging our names and they were drinking Bud Ice and they were tagging us. And Bud uh, Anheuser-Busch caught on to it. And they said, we've seen a spike of sales in your area. We want to start giving you free beer for your concerts. So they were giving us four flats, which is a lot of beer, a lot of Bud Ice for our concerts. And so me and my friend, we we quit our jobs. We moved in with his mom and we were chasing this dream. I'm, I'm doing the clothing line and me, me and him were doing this rap thing and we're just going to chase the dream. And supernatural things started to happen. Um, one morning he woke up and he said, why don't we go to Atlanta today? I mean, this came out of nowhere. We never talked about it the night before, nothing. He woke up, let's go to Atlanta today. I'm like, sure, let's do it. So I get my my tub of shirts, all my my cool clothing line, and we're driving to Atlanta. I call the only person I know, which is another strange thing. I, I know one person. I call her up. She's a DJ. I said, what's popping in Atlanta? She said, come to this address right now and bring your shirts. We show up there and Soldier Boy's Click does a photo shoot in my clothing line. If you don't know who Soldier Boy is, he's a famous rapper for a record label called SOD Money Gang. He's not in this picture. These are other guys that rap with him. Jabbar, little playboy, Arab. And I'm like, how does this happen? And I thought God is opening up the doors. He's making this stuff happen because it was, it was paranormal, supernatural. You don't just wake up and say, let's go here. And the one person, it was, it was so strange that I was like, this has to be God. It got to the point where we actually shot a music video in California and before that happened, December 2011, so from April 2005 to December 2011, I was just living this life of, I'm going to chase my dreams. I got God in my life, but I don't talk about them because I don't want people to feel like I'm shoving it down their throat and I'm fornicating and, and drinking and smoking because, hey, my cousin said that's the blessed life. And I wasn't reading the word of God for myself. But then something happened in December 2011 that stood me up out of my seat. God instantly, somehow, like this is just the only way that God can do it. I, it was like a download of information or something. But I was sitting there at my computer and I stood up out of my seat and all of a sudden it was like the blinders fell off. Like when Saul was on the road to Damascus and, and Jesus came and, and the scales fell off his eyes. Satan is the God of this world that is blinding the minds of humanity. I was a Christian who couldn't see the obviousness that Harry Potter was pushing witchcraft. I would hear Christians say, Harry Potter, that's pushing witchcraft. And I'd say, man, it's a kid's book. Let these kids imagine. And now I'm like, are you kidding me? They're putting witchcraft in a kid's book? They're trying to brainwash the kids. I could see it for what it was. I started being able to see these satanic symbols right there in, in the cartoons and, and just the agendas that were trying to brainwash humanity because the book of Revelation says that Satan is a dragon that's trying to, that he's going to deceive the entire world. And how do we think he's going to deceive the whole world with, with a tool like the media, like the internet, like a phone in your pocket and everyone has a, a device that they can watch all day long. You think that Satan's not going to use a tool like that? The music, the movies, the video games, everything. And so all of a sudden the blinders fell off and I, I was able to see this new world order and all this stuff that was coming that made me say, wait a minute, revelation is real. And we're in it. And now I believe and I want to I want to study the word of God more than ever because I want to know what I believe and I want to know what's coming and and I want to tell everybody about this. But I was still in this lifestyle right now. And so I thought, you know what? I want to move to California. I want to be a successful rapper, 
have this successful clothing line. And then when the world looks up to me, then they'll listen to me and I can tell them, you know what? Prophecy is real. And, and then they'll believe me. So we go to California and we shoot this music video. We're at a mansion, girls everywhere, beer and everything happens. It's hair and wardrobe. The, the guy who was filming it worked for MTV reality shows. Like it was, we're like, we made it. Me and my friend are walking there. We're like, how does this happen? We didn't pay for anything. We just show up. We fly to California. We show up at this mansion and everything's, it's a whole video shoot. And so I changed my flight date for a day later. I was going to go back home a day later. And when I get to the airport at the LAX airport, here's this guy wearing an SODMG hat. Now that's Soldier Boy's record label. I said, are you with SOD Money Gang? He said, I'm the CEO. I said, dude, like your guys are wearing my clothes and I'm showing him pictures of all his guys wearing my shirts. I'm pulling out all my shirts to prove like this is my clothing line. I got the tattoo of the, the logo to prove it. And I'm showing him behind the scenes video of the music video we just shot. And he's saying, man, y'all are doing it big. And he asked me to watch his Louis Vuitton bags while he walked to the store and in the airport, buys a magazine, opens it up, and there's a full page article of him in the magazine. And he autographs it and gives it to me. And I'm like, this stuff just doesn't happen to normal people. Like some <laughs> famous guy says, can you watch my Louis Vuitton bags? It was even to the point where we asked somebody in the airport to, to shoot a promo video of us. Now, this guy doesn't know me at all, and he's acting like we're together. He's like, yeah, man, we out here in California. We're fixing to go to A-Town, to Atlanta. And I'm like, this doesn't happen to normal people. I was so excited. I was like, our dreams are going to happen. We're going to move to California. We're going to be famous. And, and, and I had my mind, when the world looks up to me, then they'll listen to me. But God knew that was a bad plan. I was going to get sucked into that world of alcohol and girls and all that stuff. But I couldn't see that. I was blinded still. And, and I did. I had God had already opened my eyes to all this, you know, esoteric stuff and New World Order and all that. And when I went back home, I was so serious about moving to California that I I I put all my furniture in storage. I was sitting on the floors and I was saving up my tip money. My friend already moved in with this girl out there who set up the music video shoot, and he's calling me every day, like, when you coming, man? I was like, man, I'm just saving up my money. And then it was like God drew a line in the sand. And he said, you can have this lifestyle. If you, if you go for it, it's going to happen. You see the sponsorships. You see the celebrities that you're rubbing shoulders with. If you do it, it's going to happen. Or you can lay it all down and follow what I have for you. And in that moment, I was so just ready to do whatever God wanted. I just wanted what I wanted the truth. I wanted to do what his will was, and I laid it all down. My story is not this story of my kingdom came crumbling down and I came crawling back to God, and you're my only hope. I was at the peak, and God was giving me the choice. You can have it, or you can lay it all down. And it was like when he went up to the fishermen, when they had the biggest catch of the day, and he said, drop your nets and follow me. And so I had to call my friend. I remember, he's not going to take this well. He's calling me every day. And I said, God, just help him to receive this well. And I said, man, I'm just not going to be able to come. Some things are changing in my life. And he said, well, maybe we can try next year or something. I was mind blown. He was, that was not his character. He was never going to respond that way. Like he needed me. This was happening now. We need to do it. And so I, I continue going to work at this, um, at the valet at a hospital. And I'm so hungry for truth. I'm like, I'm picking up every little piece of literature I can find, you know, thank God for literature evangelism. People are leaving tracks in the bathroom and i'm picking something up called signs of the times oh yeah by the way jesus never offered all the kingdoms of the world that was satan satan said if you bow to me i'll give you all the kingdoms of the world he showed jesus supernaturally all the kingdoms of the world it says that satan took jesus up onto a high mountain satan is a powerful being and he, he can offer you everything and i believe that that offer didn't stop with Jesus. He's still offering that to people today. And there are people in this world who are saying, sign me up. And they want to live like a God on this world and have more money than they can ever have, more money than they can ever spend, all the girls, all the material things, and they're losing their soul. The Bible says, what profits a man to gain the whole world and lose his very soul? 
And in that moment, I realized that this was not God opening up the doors. All these supernatural things that were happening that I thought had to have been God were actually Satan doing these things. And I was falling for the trick because I wasn't in God's word. So now I'm deciding to stay home and I'm I'm finding these uh, pieces of liter uh, literature and stuff. And I, I, this says total surrender, but I'm not there yet. I wanted the Bible alone. And I started finding these tracks, signs of the times. And it, one of them was what happens when you die. And when I read it, I'm seeing 20 verses that say the dead are asleep. They're dead because when Christ returns, there's a resurrection. Why would there be a resurrection if you're already in heaven or hell? Why would you receive your judgment before the judgment? Everybody knows that there's a coming judgment day that we'll all have to face and stand before the God of the universe and, and be judged. Why would people be burning in hell for thousands of years or hundreds of years if they haven't even been judged yet? And I'm like, wait a minute. I've never heard this my entire life. And this makes sense. I was like, there are so many different beliefs in the world. I'm not going to believe anything unless I can see it in the word of God myself. I'm not going to believe what a pastor says or anything. I started doing Bible studies with my ex-girlfriend's dad and he was a Baptist guy. And he's, he started saying, you know, we believe in the pre-trib rapture. And I said, now why is that? He said, well, this verse says that we're changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And I said, okay, I see that verse, but I don't see it in some timeline before their heads are cut off. Like when I'm reading revelation, I see that the beast had power to overcome the saints and those who refuse the mark of the beast would be beheaded and all these things. And I was like, I don't, believe that i don't believe i was raised my whole life being taught that there's a pre-tribulation rapture but i'm not seeing it in the bible so now i'm questioning everything i have to see it in the word of god and i'm finding these tracks what happens when you die i was obsessed with the paranormal i wanted to know what ghosts were and now i see wait a minute ghosts are a demonic deception because the dead are dead until christ returns that's why there's a resurrection and that's why there's no ghosts because there aren't spirits just floating out of a body and they're in limbo somewhere and i realized that ghosts are a demonic deception that aliens were are a demonic deception because satan is a is a shapeshifter he transforms himself into an angel of light he appeared to eve in the garden as a serpent in the garden and now today we have people who are saying i'm i i, I see a reptilian being and i've talked to him and it's a demonic deception because it's going to play into the final deception at the end of the world. And so, and then I, I never set well with me about hell. Why would we burn forever and ever and ever just because we lived one life of ignorance or sin, even, even if we were the worst person in a hundred years of life, if it doesn't justify burning forever and ever and ever, and that never sat well with me, but I was at the point where I was like, well, you're God and I'm not. And I, I, who am I to argue with you? But when I found out the truth that the wicked will be destroyed in the lake of fire, Jesus says, fear not him who can destroy the body, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell destroyed. Even John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. There's two options here, perish or everlasting life, meaning the wicked don't have everlasting life in flames like I'd been taught my whole life. And I was like, what is this stuff? I keep finding this material. And then I found a book that said free on it. It's called A Great Hope. It's a small book that fits in your pocket, about 80 pages or something. And the first page I opened it up to said, why is there suffering? That was a question I had. Why is there suffering? And I had never heard it explained better than, I never heard any Christian explain this so well that we are learning the hard way what it's like to live in a world where we reject God's perfect law of liberty. See, we think that freedom comes from doing whatever you want, but really when you obey God's commandments, that's where true freedom is. That's what, that's a world with no pain and no suffering and no hurt and drama. You know, if you don't commit adultery, you don't steal, you don't lie. You don't, these are things that the majority of the world believes in anyway. But they don't like the first four commandments because they're all about how we love God. Keep him first. Don't have idols and don't take his name in vain. And remember the Sabbath day. Those are the things that people don't like. 
And so I'm reading this and I'm like, wait a minute, this makes so much sense. That the pain in the world is because of our free will. And the reason God gives us free will is because he loves us so much that he doesn't want to create worship robots. If he programmed us to just worship him, that wouldn't be true love. He would not be receiving love. If he used intimidation, if I put a gun to a woman's head and say, tell me you love me, she'll say the words, but I'll never experience the true love because she's acting out of fear for her life. God is looking for friends. So I was, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm so inspired by this book. I read the whole thing. I'm not a reader, but I could not put this book down. And I ordered 30 copies of it online. And that sent a door knocker at my door because I had checked a box saying I'd be interested in Bible studies, thinking I'd get <laughs> some Bible studies in the mail. But instead I got a door, a knock at the door. And I was literally, I answered the door with a beer in my hand and I, and I see this guy with this beaming smile and I'm just like, are you an angel or something? And I, and I'm so hungry that I want to talk to any Christian I know. And I'm asking him, I said, have you ever heard of a new world order? Because all these Christians think I'm a conspiracy theorist, but this makes the Bible real to me. This makes revelation seem real. And he said, you should come to this event. He pulls out a, a flyer out of his back pocket in a church, a block down the road for me. The first night in writing said new world order. And I'm like, what? There's a church talking about this stuff. Get in here, man. We need to talk. And he starts sharing all the same stuff that I'm finding out that the dead are dead until the resurrection, that hell is a annihilation of the wicked because Jesus is going to create a perfect world where there's no more pain, no more tears, no more sorrow. How can that be true if your family members are burning for eternity? And I never met anyone that, that showed me all this stuff right from the Bible. I had heard a lot of stuff in church. I'd heard a lot of sermons that taught me things that I didn't see proof of in the scriptures. And this guy was showing me the scriptures. And I thank God that he never judged me. He saw me drinking a beer. He saw um, I was living with a woman that I wasn't married with. He smelled the house, smell like marijuana. And he never judged me. He said, let's study. He was excited that a person like me wanted to study. And it was the word of God that changed my life. It wasn't, if he would have came in and said, man, you need to pour that out. You need to put that out. You two need to get married or she needs to move. If he would have came into my house and said all that stuff, I would have said, get out of my house, you judgmental person. But because we were reading the Bible and I was saying, I want to do whatever your will is. I have to see it in the word of God. I started seeing where it said, be sober for we're in the last days and Satan's as a roaring lion. And I realized that Satan wanted my brain to be intoxicated. He wanted me to be deceived. And I was like, I can't, I can't overcome this addiction in my life. I'm addicted to marijuana. I'm addicted to alcohol. And people that say you're, that weed's not addictive, it is. Every day I didn't have it. I was irritable. I spent the whole day looking for it. I was 30 minutes or 30 minutes before I'd get off work. My stomach would be nauseous until I'd drink my beer. And I, I said, okay, I'm going to cut back. And every day I'd say, I'm not going to do it today. Some, some minion from Satan would send his minions in the form of my friends to knock on my door and say, what's up, bro? I brought some beer and some weed. And I'd say, well, I didn't pay for it. I'd make excuses. And so New Year's 2013, I remember just crying out to God. And I said, God, I am weak, but you are strong. I don't want this in my life. Take it out of my life. If I give you permission, remove it. And I woke up the next day without a single withdrawal. Supernatural freedom and victory that I could never do on my own. He got me over the hardest part, the withdrawals. But the tempter's still there. And so every day I was tempted. I'm, I'm pumping gas at a, at a gas pump and there's a glowing beer sign in my face. And now I'm become dependent upon him instead of a beer. And I say, God, give me the strength not to go in there and buy a beer. And I would get to go, drive home in victory every day. It was the word of God that changed my life. And I, and I started hearing about the 10 commandments and I believe the 10 commandments because I, it's like Christianity 101, right? If you're every church had the 10 commandments in there, in their building. And then I started hearing about the Sabbath, the fourth commandment. And I'm like, this is interesting. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Wait a minute. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Saturday. Why don't we go to church on Sunday? And I started realizing like everything in my life that I believed was a lie. And I was like, the word of God is the truth and the truth will make you free. 
and I saw it plain as day right there in the Ten Commandments. So I started asking questions and I'd I'd get responses from people. Well, that was the Old Testament. That was for the Jews, but we're we're in the New Testament and we keep the Sabbath. We keep the Sabbath on Sunday because Jesus is resurrected. And I was like, okay. So we we memorialize the day that Jesus resurrected, but I don't see a commandment for it. And so I, I kept studying and I'd see that God blessed it at creation because people say, well, that, that was just the 10 commandments, but wait a minute, Genesis two, verse two and three said, and on the seventh day of creation, God ended his work that he had made and he rested on the seventh day and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. And he rested from his work. Wait a minute. God blessed the seventh day at creation long before a Jew or Moses or the 10 commandments. And so I, I continued to study and I'd see that, wait a minute, the word Sabbath actually appeared before the Ten Commandments even are talked about in the Bible. Exodus 16, the Ten Commandments come in at Exodus chapter 20, but in Exodus 16, verse 26, it says, six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there, there shall be none. So it's talking about when they're gathering manna and God says on the seventh day, there will be no manna because it's the Sabbath. The word Sabbath was mentioned before the Ten Commandments were written. So now I know that the Sabbath existed before it was blessed on the seventh day of creation. It was mentioned as Sabbath before the Ten Commandments were given. And God says to remember it. But are the commandments, are keeping the commandments still important? This is a, a deep study, but when you look into, there's a verse that says that they're blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. And people will say this is um, blotting out the, the Ten Commandments, but there's there's two different commandments. There's the ones that were written in the book of Moses, and there was the ones written in stone by God's own finger that are going to stand forever. And so in this verse, you see at the bottom, it says, let, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day, or the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which were a shadow of things to come. And so people will say, look, we're not supposed to judge people on, on the Sabbath day. It says it right here. But when you look at the context, it says, which were a shadow of things to come. When God blessed the seventh day at creation, that wasn't a shadow. When he put in the Ten Commandments, that wasn't a shadow. And it says, or of Sabbath days, plural, because the Jews in the in the law of Moses, they had many Sabbath days. It doesn't say don't judge in keeping the Sabbath day. It says Sabbath days. And if you look at this chart, it says four Sabbaths. All those holy days were called Sabbath days. The book of the law was against us, Deuteronomy 31, 26 says. And it says, take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark. Not inside the ark, but in a pocket in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God that it may be a witness against thee. So the Ten Commandments are not against us. This verse says, where does it say it? Oh, in verse 14, blotting out the handwriting, not the finger writing of God, but the handwriting of ordinances, which was against us. And the, the handwriting that was against us was the book of the law that was on the side of the ark. So the difference is, is the handwriting of Moses was the book of the law on the side of the ark. It stood against us. But in Exodus 40, 20, it says, and he took and put the Testament into the Ark. The Ten Commandments were actually inside the Ark of the Covenant. So does the day matter? You know, some people say, well, I keep a Sabbath day. I, I remember one day. Well, Romans 14, 5 through 6 says, one man esteemeth the day. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So some people use this verse and say, look, it doesn't matter what day you keep as long as you're persuaded in your own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doeth not regard it. He that eateth, listen to this part. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth, he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. So the context of this is not about the Sabbath day at all. It's about the Pharisees making up laws that said every Tuesday or whatever day it was, you cannot eat. It's a mandatory fasting day. But some people didn't do that. And they said, look, 
Some people were convicted by it and they say, I'm going to eat not unto the Lord. And some people said, I'm convicted by it and I'm, I'm going to eat unto the Lord. It had nothing to do with the Sabbath day. It was actually about fasting days. These that was also not a law of God, but a, a Pharisaical law. Some people say Jesus never mentioned the Sabbath. They say, you know, it, Jesus mentioned all the commandments except the Sabbath, and therefore we don't got to keep it. That's bad logic anyway, because there's a lot of things that aren't mentioned in the New Testament. It doesn't mention things like bestiality and pedophilia and all these type things, and we know that we shouldn't do them, right? So just because it's not mentioned doesn't mean we shouldn't keep it. But Matthew 24, Jesus is speaking of the future tribulation to come. It's a very famous chapter, Matthew 24. It describes the end of the world. And Jesus says, and woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight not be in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So Jesus himself out of his own mouth is talking about in the, in the last days, pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath day. Because he obviously knows that the Sabbath is still important, even in the last days. So this is a good one. I, I'm trying to give you these so that you can be equipped when people come against you and say, you know what, we don't got to keep that anymore. I've studied stuff with people and I'd show them so many verses and then they'd go to their pastor and he'd show them one verse and they'd say, you know what, I don't believe that because this verse. I'm like, wait a minute, you're rejecting like the 20 verses I showed you. We even talked about that verse that he said. When, when it comes to like a lot of verses saying one thing and then a handful of verses that seem to contradict the Bible, the Bible never contradicts itself. We have to study out those verses in great detail and then let the evidence weigh itself out. And where the most of the weight is, that's the truth. And so the context was fasting. When I started learning about the Sabbath, this guy I was studying with me and he said, turn to Isaiah 66, 22 and 23. And he said, read it. And I, I had a New Living Translation Bible. My, that guy that I was studying with, that Baptist guy, he gave me this version because he said, it's easier to understand. You know, it's it's just written in modern language. And so I'm reading it and I says, as surely as my new heavens and earth will remain, so will you always be my people with a name that will never disappear, says the Lord. All humanity will come to worship me from week to week and from month to month. And this guy looked at me, he said, that's what your Bible says? I said, yeah, and I showed him. He said, read mine. And I read it. These are other translations. English Standard Version, Berean Standard Bible, King James. It says, and it, King James says, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh, not Jewish flesh, all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And I was like, wait a minute. I At this point, I'm starting to, it doesn't matter which Bible version I'm reading. Is the Sabbath such an important issue that Satan is literally trying to, to hide it in new versions of the Bible? Because from week to week could be any day. And so then I started really contemplating, Does is there a spiritual war even in the Bibles? And I'm not here to push, you have to use one, one Bible, God. I can use any Bible. We have to really study things out. And I just want to show you that there are some translations that literally say the opposite of what the King James says. And so it's my own personal conviction. God pointed me back to the King James Bible in three really big ways. And that one about the Sabbath was the final one. And I said, you know what? I'm never reading this one again. And I, I started, I went back to the King James Bible. Look at these verses in the in the King James, it says that the wicked, his ways are always grievous. But all these other translations are saying that his ways are prosperous. This one says the wicked were forgotten. The rest of them say the wicked were praised. This one says it, it removed the word not, not increase the joy to increase their joy. Or things which he hath not seen to things that he has seen. And so... I'll leave these on screen. This came from a book called In Awe, A-W-E, In Awe of Thy Word. And it's a very thick book all about the history of the King James Version and 
why it uses phrases like thee and thy and thou, because even those subtle things have meaning. Like if I say I'm speaking to thee or I'm speaking to thou, one means I'm speaking to thee, a whole crowd of people, or one saying I'm speaking to thou, one person, different little things like that. And so if you want to look that up, there's a, a free version. It's a PDF, free PDF called In Awe of Thy Word. And the first couple of pages has these examples of where the Bible's other versions are changed. And so I was starting to really believe like we are in a spiritual war and there must be something special about the Sabbath that the word Sabbath was changed to week. And some of these other things, like when they asked Jesus, um, how come we couldn't cast this demon out of this guy? Jesus said, this one comes out through prayer and fasting. And a lot of newer translations or other translations just say, this one comes out by prayer. It removes the, the and fasting, which shows me that there's power in fasting. And that's why Satan is trying to hide it. Um, those disciples were clearly praying, but they weren't getting the results. And so Jesus said, this one comes out by fasting. Uh, some people think that Jesus broke the Sabbath because he ate on the Sabbath, but that was only in the eyes of the Pharisees. They said, oh, him and his, him and his disciples are breaking the Sabbath. But the fourth commandment says nothing about not eating on the Sabbath or picking a, a piece of corn. And the Sabbath is a blessing. It's not a burden. God wants us to have the blessing of the Sabbath. We get to rest. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you're trying to put me under the law and you're you're trying to make me do works. And it's like the Sabbath is the opposite of works. It's the opposite of law because it's about relation. And so some everybody knows that, or a lot of people know that salvation is a relationship with Jesus. And if you're in a relationship like a marriage, Jesus calls us his bride. If you're in a marriage, don't you want to set apart one day a week for date night, right? To build that relationship, to, to rekindle that fire. That's what God wants with us. He says, remember this day, spend it with me. Don't do anything else. Set everything aside and let's spend that time together. It's a beautiful blessing. The Pharisees are adding to the law. The disciples, um, the Sabbath is all through the New Testament. The disciples taught on the Sabbath. Jesus preached on the Sabbath. I don't have the time for some of these. I need to be wrapping it up, but I wanted to show you these. Um, and it's important to keep God's law. It's all in the in the Bible, in the New Testament, where Paul actually says in Romans 3.31, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. So people that say, look, we don't have to keep the law anymore. Um, 1 Corinthians 7.19 says, circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing, which is a works-based thing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Um, Jesus spoke about it a lot. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The commandments are the commandments of love. The first four are how we love God. And the last six are how we love humanity. And that's why Jesus said, all the law hangs on these things. Love God and love your neighbor. It doesn't mean they're done away with. God wrote them on our heart because he wants us to love these laws of liberty when we have God's commandments in our heart and we strive to obey them, we will have freedom. We will have victory in our life. We will have uh, good things will come to us because when you disobey God and you do things your own way, it only leads to misery and drama and dead end roads. I've been there. I've done it all. And I just pray that my testimony is an inspiration to somebody out there that if you have family and friends that are lost and they seem like a lost cause, never stop praying for them. My mom never stopped praying for me. She interceded for me like Moses on the mountain interceding with the Israelites. When they, when God brought them through the parted waters, they started worshiping a golden calf and God was going to destroy them rightfully so. But Moses pleaded with the Lord in the prayers of one man saved all those people never give up on your family and friends continue praying for them intercessory power intercessory prayer is powerful don't judge people we don't know where they're at if a prostitute walked into our church i pray that we would not run up there and say whoa you can't come in here like that 
I pray that we would love her and say, can I help you? Can I pray with you for anything? Come sit next to me. Would you like to study the Bible together? Because the word of God changed my life and it set me free because the truth will make you free and never be afraid to surrender everything to God. I thought God wanted to take away my dreams, but he gave me the gifts and talents that I had. I was using them the wrong way. And now I still get to make t-shirts, but I make them for God. I still get to make videos, but I don't make music videos. I make, you know, gospel Christian videos. And now I still get invited place to place to be on stage, but now I'm not glorifying myself. Now I'm glorifying and pointing people to him. And now my life has eternal purpose. Whereas I lived a life of uh, fun and, and then the next day was regret. And it's just this endless cycle. This is where we want to be. This is the life that God knows us better than we could ever know ourselves. And he knows what brings true joy and true peace. And I pray that this was a blessing. I pray that it answered some questions that you might've had about certain topics and just know that the word of God is the truth. And it told me the truth about UFO or about <laughs> yeah aliens and ghosts and what happens when you die. And the truth about the Sabbath where I wasn't hearing that from the church, or I wasn't hearing it from other Christians. We need to be in the word of God ourselves to study, to show our own selves approved because Satan is out here trying to deceive the whole world. And if we do not know the truth, we will fall for the counterfeit. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Brother Mikey. That was very, very powerful. I was very moved by your testimony. And thank you for thank sharing you all this. Are you still available for comments and questions? Absolutely. Yes. yes? Okay. So anybody who would like to share a comment or anybody that has questions, um, now is the time. Um, I want to say thank you so much, uh, Mikey. That was, I, I, I actually, this is Denise, by the way, I invited oh, hey. you, yes, to, to share your testimony and to share some Bible truths that really brought you across the line and you truly mm -hmm. brought it to the T and, and I, I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank Man, you. So much. Thank you. Yeah. It was, you know, when I, um, accepted Christ in my heart, I didn't know what to do with it. And I was being led astray by my cousin who actually inspired me to read the Bible. So you know, God can use anybody. He used a donkey to speak to, you know, who was that in the Bible? Um, yeah. So God can use a donkey. God used my cousin because I looked up to him and he inspired me to do the right thing, which was read the Bible. But then I should have stayed in the Bible. And instead I went to man and man will always lead you astray. You know, maybe not always, but a lot of times you're setting yourself up if uh, you're not in the word of God yourself. And actually, even if you are getting the truth from somebody, fact check them, go to the word of God. If they tell you something, look it up yourself. And um, I really got into chain, chain referencing. I would like highlight using different colors, like every, every verse about what happens when you die or every verse about when the rapture happens, I would use different colors. And then I'd, I'd made a key in the back of my Bible and I could look at it. And it says like, what happens when you die? It's orange. Okay. And I could flip to all those. And I, that's what, that's how we have to study. It has to be line upon line, precept upon precept here, a little, there, a little by the mouth of two or three witnesses. We can't make entire doctrines out of one text because you can really make a lot of strange doctrines that way. True. I appreciate it, Mikey, because while I was listening to you, um, I was just kind of imagining you know, watching a movie of your testimony. And uh, I just love the narrative as to how you incorporated a Bible study within your testimony. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, I really appreciate, uh, you know, how you delivered that. Amen. Denise inspired me to do that. And I, I think I might do that more often. <laughs> Amen. Clifford, you have a question? I, uh, I applaud your words. I too at a young age, started out at 12, started as a musician. Mm. I came out here as a musician. And uh, it's true, uh, the 
you have to taste for yourself yeah. and you not only taste, but you've got to realize what you're tasting and, and one taste leads to another and you begin to realize what's good and you have to check yourself, always check mm -hmm. yourself because as you're tasting, someone's always trying to feed you something that's a little different and mm -hmm. it's just the way you think of it. But his thoughts are clear. His words are clear. All you have to do is be about what you're supposed to be about and understand what God has for you. I I really appreciate your testimony. Live some of it and know just what you're talking about. Thank you. Uh, amen. That's beautiful. Thank you. Amen. And I want to add to that, too. You know, it's amazing how... And I love what you said, too, about how sometimes we think we have to be all cleaned up to come to God, but mm -hmm. he meets us exactly where we are, mm -hmm. you know, filthy rags as we are, you know, God meets yeah. us where we are. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to purify us, cleanse us. Um, and, you know, I love what you also said about the King James Version Bible, because I actually got my King James Version this year after much prayer, much study, you know, as wow. God revealed to me because you know, I learned about certain Bible um, Bibles that don't have scripture, you know, and they take it out or they change the words. And, you know, that was God from sermons to study, like God was showing me that. So, you know, you saying this today, even today is another confirmation as to praise God why I have my Bible that I do now. Um, and thank you. You know, your your testimony really spoke to me, too. It's some. It's amazing to see how God could can and will transform many lives if and I love what you also said about studying the word for ourselves mm -hmm. because you anybody in the pulpit, anybody in the study, anybody can you know the devil knows scripture, but we okay. have to study for ourselves. So thank you for saying that. Thank you and thank you for tonight. I don't know if someone else wants to share anything or have another question before we close out. Well, you just gave me goosebumps because <laughs> I already had some of this, like the the Sabbath study, but I added that King James thing last minute. Like it was literally the last thing I was putting in there and I just felt led to, I, it definitely was Holy Spirit because I, I was reading that New Living Translation, which now I know is actually a paraphrase. It's not even a translation, but um, there, there was a couple different things that happened one time. I was thinking about a verse and I was, it was me and this woman I was living with at the time we were studying with this guy. And, uh, I was like, there's a verse, there's something, uh, there's a verse about, he was, his mouth was shut. He was, he was dumb. Like, uh, oh, I said, there's a verse about being led like a sheep to the slaughter. I was like, there's a verse that says that. And I was looking up on the internet and I'd see stuff that was similar, but not quite. And I was like, what is that verse? And, and all of a sudden I stood up. And I go into the, the closet and I'm just looking for this Bible that I remember my mom gave me. She gave me a, a, a small Bible and I asked for that specifically one because it had these little references. Like it would it would put an asterisk by a certain word and tell you what it what the um, a different meaning was so you could understand it more. And but I didn't even read it. It was in my closet. And I was just so like, I gotta find this verse. And I start digging in that closet. Oh, this was later, by the way. It wasn't because I was looking for that verse. I gave up on it because I even Googled it, couldn't find the verse. Later, I was just like, felt like me and my girlfriend should read something. So I'm digging out that Bible. I opened it up, King James Bible, and I opened to where the bookmark was. And I just said, well, we should just read here. And I start reading. I read the whole first page and something in me is like, maybe I should quit. And I was like, no, I'm going to finish the whole chapter. And I... That doubt hit me and I said, no, I'm going to read the whole chapter. When I got to the next part, I read the verse and, and it was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And me and her just both burst into tears. I was like, I can't believe it. God led me to my Bible and this verse, this bookmark has been here for years. And I open it up and I read this and this is the exact verse I was looking for. And it was the King James Bible. So that stuck with me. And then there was some other situation. I can't remember what it was. But there was three distinct things that I feel like were just God saying, this is the version you should read. And I know there's a lot of people out there that are like King James only, and they're kind of zealous about it. I'm not that overboard with it, but I do want people to understand that 
I, I like to I like to parallel like read verses. If I'm if I'm doing a presentation and that and I want a verse in there and it's like it's really good, but it's real King Jamesy and old English. I will look at other translations, and if there is one that's really plain English, but it doesn't change the context, I'll put it in a presentation. I'm not against using another one, but it it can't change the context. It can be clearer, but it, it can't change the words. And when I see all these other translations that are literally changing the whole context, I'm convicted that I have to read the King James for myself. Yes, I agree. I do the same. <laughs> <laughs> that's so you know it, it's true you know there's versions that you know are more understanding of some people but anybody else any comments questions thank you again mikey this was very powerful i loved it thank um, you for having me it was a blessing to to get to share i always love to share my story love to share what god did in my life and all glory to him because there's nothing i could do of myself it was all him amen all right, let's um, have a word of prayer now um, and close out. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful, Lord, for tonight's um, testimony and, and study, Father, through our brother Mikey Jenny, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for using him, Father, to speak to our hearts and our minds, Father. We are so thankful, Lord, for the victories in his life, Father. We praise you for the transformation you've done in Mikey's life, Father. And Lord, um, he's a living testimony, Lord, of, of who you are and what you are able to do if we are just willing to surrender our all, Lord. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Lord, for using um, Brother Mikey, Lord. And Father, now everything that he does, Lord, is to glorify you. So I just pray that as he continues in this ministry, Lord, that he will continue to glorify you through his work and that everything that he does and say, Father, may be to your honor and to your glory. Father, please continue to bless him, his his family, his mother, Lord. Give her healing, Father. Mm -hmm. I just pray that you'll continue to provide for their needs. And Father, just thank you for your goodness. Thank you um, that you love us. And Lord, help us to surrender all to you, Lord. And until we can meet again, Lord, may we just prepare our hearts and mind, Lord, for Jesus' soon return. We love you and praise you and thank you. In Jesus' loving name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for remembering my mom. That means a lot. Yes. All right, brother. And thank you guys. We'll see you guys next Tuesday, God willing. Thank you. God bless. Thank you God again. Bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Good night. Good night.